have no young assets. Like, the only thing that they want, they're going to give us a return. Patrick Beverly, Lou Williams? No, we don't want that. Give us some young, young players. Give us some picks. Hello and welcome to the Friday, February 12th edition of the TV on Basketball Podcast with your host, TV. Hope your day is going great and thank you for clicking on to watch or listen to today's episode. Before we start, I have to plug my other platforms. Remember to follow at TV on Basketball on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram for updates on the podcast and for other fantastic content. Follow me on TikTok for daily NBA content, including daily NBA recaps. And from from time to time, you can catch some just good NBA discussions in under a minute. So check out my TikTok as well. If you're on YouTube, remember to like, share, and subscribe. Hit the not- notification bell so you are alerted whenever I post. That would be highly appreciated. If for all my podcast listeners, remember to subscribe and leave a review if you're on Apple. As for the Spotify, Anchor, or Podbean listeners, continue to show your support in whatever way you can. I have an action-packed show lined up for you guys today. I'm going to be talking about the Kyle Lowry trade rumors, KG's comments on the current game. Obviously, we're going to end it with the game of the week. So yeah, it's, it's going to be a really action-packed episode. I hope you all enjoy it. So sit back, relax, and let's jump into the first topic. And we're going to be talking about Kyle Lowry. Because, one, he is from my favorite team, the Toronto Raptors. The greatest Raptor of all time. The GROAT, as we like to call him. And there have been a lot of rumors surrounding Kyle Lowry this, you know, this past week. And it all started with a athletic article where... I, um, forgive me, I forgot the writer, but he posted his article basically saying that a portion of Raptors management thinks it's time to, um, to, um, sever ties with Kyle Lowry and trade him. Now, this isn't, um, anything really surprising. Obviously, with the Raptors, like, kind of going into the next phase of their team, I mean, Kyle Lowry is kind of like the last, kind of like, main piece from the old era, so it kind of does make sense. But it's also a portion of the Raptors management. I don't think this is really like their true intention. Um, obviously, Masai and Bobby Webster, the two guys at the top there, like to keep things really low key. I mean, there have been like a lot. Um, there's a reason why you don't hear a lot of like Raptors rumors in terms of getting trades done or like stuff that's happening within the organization because they really keep it, you know, locked tight, low key. And so I didn't really make much of it. I really didn't. I mean, it was just a portion of Raptors management. So. Like, it, like it, I didn't really take it seriously. I really didn't. And it wasn't really until, like, a few days later when there was a report, I believe, from either, I think, someone on Twitter, um, like, a reporter from Twitter, or like, some Toronto site or something, that Kyle Lowry actually um, listed up his Toronto home up for sale. And that's when the, you know, the gears started turning. That's when um, the internet kind of went to a frenzy, like, oh, oh shoot. The Athletic reported this earlier on, and now that Tr- Kyle Lowry has put his Toronto home up for sale, it really does feel like um, that he's gonna um, gonna get traded and and stuff like that. And I honestly don't think that'll happen, but this whole thing with Kyle Lowry really is gonna depend on him. The way the Wizards are going about it with Bradley Beal, saying like, "Look, we're not gonna trade him unless he requests a trade, and then we'll try to send him to a location." Um, of his um, of his choosing. And I think this is going to be the same thing for Kyle Lowry out here in Toronto. He is the growth, like I said, the greatest Raptor of all time, NBA champion, multiple-time All-Star. And I think he has that relationship with Masai and the relationship with the organization where they're communicating enough to the point where, look, if Kyle Lowry wants to leave, I mean, he requests a trade, we'll abide by it. Because... This guy like deserves like the utmost respect within the organization and fans alike. Um, he is a fan favorite here, and although I would not want to see him leave, if he does request a trade, I would understand, and we just want to see him succeed at the end of the day. But I, I just don't think that'll happen. I think um, he is, of course, an impending free agent, and for me, like I wouldn't be surprised if he'd leave in free agency, but I don't think that's going to happen You know, this season in terms of a trade happening. I think the Raptors look at their roster and be like, look, if Kyle Lowry decides to leave, he's either going to come back on a smaller deal or he's going to go to another team. 
and we're gonna have this cap room and i think we could start you know maneuvering some pieces around then but right now i think they sit seventh or eighth in the eastern conference still under 500 after a loss with to the boston celtics yesterday i still think they're gonna ride out the season i really think they, they're going to and whatever larry um makes a decision which is down the line i believe I, I, whenever free agency starts whenever that's going to be I think that's when he'll probably leave and there, there are obviously potential suitors there's obviously people wanting to go after him I mean I'm going to talk about that like in a couple in a couple seconds but I just don't think um, the trade is imminent right now I think unless Kyle Lowry like specifically asked for a trade I don't think the move is going to happen um, he might leave I think it's very likely he's going to leave maybe he wants to go back home to Philly and stuff like that and I completely respect him for that, but right now, un um, unless like a trade request comes out of nowhere, I think that Kyle Lowry is going to stay at least for the remainder of this season. But there are definitely some, you know, trade candidates. There's definitely some teams interested in him, and there are three teams I want to talk about. And kind of if a trade were to happen, what a Toronto fan would kind of like in return. Um, there are three teams here who have been in Kyle Lowry rumors probably since the off season. And we're going to talk about him here right now. So we're going to start with the first team here. And we're going to be talking about the Miami Heat. Um, they're obviously in a park in a in like kind of a, a rut right now. I think they're still not in any of the play-in spots. And they've had a rough start to the season, obviously, due to the COVID protocols and all that, due to injuries. And they're always in rumors of trying to get kind of another star, per se, or kind of the next piece to help them in their hunt for a championship. And Kyle Lowry has been circulating in those trade rumors a lot. And for me, you know, like, I wouldn't mind doing business with the Miami Heat. But there's just two options, I think, as a, like, as the Raptors, as Messiah Jiri, that you would want in return. One, option one, is Tyler Hero. He needs to be included in this deal, and then we'll take some contract fillers. That would be the number one option in this deal. Tyler Hero um, played great in the playoffs, kind of had a slow start to this season, but he's still a very good young player with a ton of potential. But I think the way that Miami Heat, um, the Miami Heat view Tyler Hero, and what a lot of fans talk about him, I don't think they want him to leave. I really don't think get, um, that um, they want Tyler Hero as a part of this trade. So if anything, for as an other, as another option, I wouldn't mind getting someone like a Kendrick Nunn, obviously some filler contracts and some picks, and that's the key part. We need Kendrick Nunn and picks or Tyler Hero. That's really the two options I could see f um, for like a trade. Um, in order to get like, kind of not equal value because there's always going to be like someone who gets a short end of the stick of a trade, but just kind of to like help compensate for at least our future. And Kyle Lowry being on Miami Heat, I think will fit really well. Put him in that starting lineup, put him beside Jimmy Butler, just beside Duncan Robinson with Bam. I mean, I could see them being a top three, top four seed in the East. I mean, as constructed right now, I just would not want to face him in the playoffs. I still think... They are a top five team in this in the East. Add in Kyle Lowry, who honestly fits their culture a lot. And with, like, obviously with Jimmy Butler, he plays well on the defensive end. He can hit the three. I think it will be a good fit in Miami. Like I said, like, the only thing I think would be, like, a positive, like, coming back for the Raptors, maybe none, Achua, and pick, and a couple of picks, or Tyler Hero. We need someone either with that star potential instead of Tyler Hero. Or two like nice building pieces, pieces like Precious Achua and Kendrick Nunn. Now, do I think the Heat are gonna want to give up less than that? Yeah, I think the more likely situation is Kendrick Nunn. I think they um, view Precious Achua pretty highly, and obviously, like I said, Tyler Hero is one of their golden boys. So I don't. I think the Nunn trade is probably the most likely. Another team that is on in the hunt for a third star or a point guard or something of that sort is the Philadelphia 76ers. And apparently this is probably the most likely option. They have at least enough picks to help compensate. Um, they have some young pieces that I would be, um, would be interested in. And I think, honestly, this is probably the most likely option. In a trade back for the Raptors, I wouldn't mind getting someone like a Tyrese Maxey and a Matisse Thybulle. Um, I don't know how, like, I have a feeling the 76ers high, um, valued Tyrese Maxey very highly because they didn't want to pull the Harden trade because of him. But bringing back, you know, if we can get a Tyrese Maxey, a Matisse Tybo, and some picks in return for Kyle Lowry, that would be good. I would be, I would be happy with the trade. 
And I, honestly, I'd just be happy for him because Lowry's a Philly guy. He he would be going back home. And I think the 76ers, honestly, if they have Kyle Lowry on the court, would kind of maybe take them over the top. I think that would honestly make them title contenders. Even as the way they're constructed, I think they have the chance to. I mean, right now, sitting number one in the East. But with Kyle Lowry on the team, um, obviously, you might have to give up someone like a Matisse Tybal. But I still think it is a very good... Um, is, he would make them like a really elite team. Like I said, he'd be going home. I think he would fit nice next to Ben Simmons. I mean, he they could kind of split ball handling um, responsibilities. And he would, be, he would do a good job feeding Joel Embiid down in the post. So I think that would be... Another good option for him. At least for the Raptors as well. Because I actually like the assets coming back. And then we have this third team. And they're in the rumors for like just in the point guard market in general. But the reason I don't want Larry going here is because... Not because, you know, not because of the team. I mean, this team is a title contender. If they had Kyle Larry, that would um, give them like a lot of chance versus the Lakers and stuff like that. But we're just not going to gain anything, anything in return. And that is the LA Clippers. Like... <laughs> Look, if there was something on that team besides Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, that enticed me as a as as like a fan of the team ever or entices like management, I wouldn't mind. I wouldn't mind whatsoever. But they have nothing past that. They just they just don't. Like they got rid of all their picks in the Paul George trade. They have oh, so much money tied in, you know, Mark Marcus Morris, Kawhi, and PG. They have no young assets. Like, the only thing that they're... What? They're going to give us a return. Patrick Beverly, Lou Williams? No, we don't want that. Give us some young young players. Give us some picks. But they have none of that. <laughs> they have no assets. And, you know, I just I just don't think, like, anything like the Clippers do, it's not going to be, like, anything major to that point guard position. I mean, I think I've talked about, like, when I talked about the Derrick Rose trade before, I, I wanted him to go to the Clippers, but... It feels like the Knicks had just enough assets for the um for the Pistons to to um, pull off the deal with them instead, and that's like I mean if they if they can't even get Derrick Rose I mean what do they expect in trying to get Kyle Lowry, no picks whatsoever and they have no young assets, like I just I just I just don't, if anything if I'm aside do not do business with the Clippers, I want them to be on a championship contender I want them to succeed but no there's just nothing on that team like what Terrence Mann nah. Do you, like, do you want to give us a Zubac? No. No, nothing. Just absolutely nothing. I mean, the Miami Heat and 76ers, at least you got some enticing pieces there that, that we can get back. And they actually have some picks to maybe help compensate. But the Clippers, no. Um, I know they want to be in these rumors. I know contracts could work. But just just no. If I'm here at the Clippers, like, what do you have? Um, you want Terrence Mann? No, just hang up. Just hang up. That's about it. And, I mean, those are the three options for Kyle Lowry. And like I said like in the beginning of the segment, whatever happens, he is the GROAT, the greatest Raptor of all time. People are talking about building statues for him. I wouldn't mind. He is the greatest Raptor of all time. He will be, like, cheered. He would be beloved every time he returns back to the city. He is one of our owns. And at the end of the day, the fans will respect his decision. Um, we want him to, be, to retire as a Raptor. Obviously, that would be great. But if he thinks he can like still like um, get a like a championship, maybe he can still contribute to a very good team, we would respect it. We would one hundred percent respect it. Let's move on to this. I haven't. I've made our All Star selections, I believe, last week with Joe for the All Star starters, but I haven't even talked about the returns. And yesterday, All Star second returns came back, and I'm gonna talk obviously talk about like some things that I find really interesting in the voting, and also. Are the fans getting it right? So let's get right into this. Um, some of the notes I do have um, in these returns. I mean, there's obviously some outliers on, on these lists. Carmelo Anthony, extremely, extremely um, popular among the community. He's 10th in the front court. Alex Caruso, obviously the one of the biggest memes in the NBA. 10th in the back court for the West. Um, some really odd ones in the Eastern side of things. Derrick Rose. I mean, like I said, a lot. Of, it's the same thing with Caruso and Melo. Everyone loves him. Right now, he sits 8th in voting, which, honestly, I'm only surprised about because he's ahead of Russell Westbrook. That's the only thing I'm really, like, surprised about. Russell Westbrook being ninth is pretty low, in my opinion. And, um, yeah, I'm just surprised that, you know, Derrick Rose has, like, I mean, it's only a couple thousand votes, but at the end of the day, it's still ahead of Russell Westbrook. I'm happy that um, Donovan Mitchell is actually fourth in guard voting. That means people are recognizing what he's doing, and I'm really happy about that. 
Andrew Wiggins, as well, is getting quite a bit of votes, more than Brandon Ingram, and and stuff like that. So I'm really happy with that. Over five hundred thousand votes for Andrew Wiggins, seventh in the West front court. I mean, that I, I just find that really cool. I mean, obviously he's not going to be an All Star, but he's having a good year. So I'm happy to see um, him getting some recognition. Christian Wood being eighth. Thank you, NBA fans, for recognizing how good this man is. Obviously, he's injured with the ankle stuff, and hopefully he can come back in the next week or so. But yeah, happy that people are are recognizing him. And the Raptor finally made it to the um, to the um, All Star voting. I mean, Fred Van Vliet, number ten in the guards. If I didn't talk about this in the, because I didn't talk about the first returns, but there was no Raptors whatsoever, which is weird because Spicy P got voted in as a front court um, member last year, and he's nowhere to be seen in this top ten at all. I mean, the drop off is significant. You got people like Jeremy Grant ahead of him and Julius Randle, which, I mean, understandable. I mean, Pascal Siakam has had an up and down year, but not even the top 10 really does surprise me. Another um, thing I'm really happy about is to see that Jalen Brown has over a million votes over um, just like I believe he's like fourth in the Eastern guards, which is really good for him. Um, really happy that people are, are recognizing the moves he's making this year as well. So good to see him on there. Obviously, his uh, his teammate Jason Tatum also in the top four in the Eastern front court. But yeah, those are like kind of like the main takeaways from here. If I had to choose any other ones, I mean, it's good. I mean, John Morant still has like fifth in um, West guards, which is very, very interesting. I mean, obviously, he's kind of had a not like the best year yet. I mean, he's he's had a really good year. Obviously, the Memphis Grizzlies are playing pretty well, but um i'm glad to see that he still has that hype around him because we i feel like we don't really talk about it much this year for people who are saying that zion is still not popular i mean right now he's eight hundred forty thousand votes right now six in the west i think that's still pretty popular but um it is what it is and honestly another thing i'm surprised about just because of popularity and stuff i'm surprised that Lomelo ball is not in any of these returns do i think he deserves it no 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 but I was just thinking that, hmm, people are going to see the hype in him. I thought he would at least be, like, somewhere in the top 10 for Eastern guards. But the big question here, I mean, obviously the NBA has made the changes where 50% fans, 25% players, and 25% media in terms of the voting. But are the NBA fans getting it right right now? We look at the East. If we're doing, like, the old fan 100% voting thing, this would be the starting five. Bradley Beal, number one in the East in voting. Kyrie Irving. And that's his backward mate. And the front court would contain Durant, Giannis, and Embiid. When we look at the East, I'm okay with this. I'm completely okay with this. Um, in terms of the front court, I don't think that needs to be touched. And the, and with the voting discrepancy between third and fourth, the NBA fans think so too. I mean, Embiid has over 3 million votes. And number four is Jason Tatum, who is just under seven, uh, 1.7 million. So the discrepancy is there. And in the guard section, I mean, I am I would be okay with Kyrie Irving in the starting lineup. He is having a fantastic year. Um, obviously, kind of up and down the Nets are, but he is still playing at a very high level. James Harden is right behind him, by the way, with 1.8 million votes, where Kyrie, I think, has just over 2 million. I mean, he is having a career year. I mean, like he's averaging like the most points he's had in his career. I mean, this is like a season high in points per game, 27.9. And, uh, you know, the, the Nets are doing pretty well. So whether you want to have James Harden there or Kyrie Irving, I wouldn't mind. And Bradley Beal is still number one with um, quite comfortably there in the East Guard. So in terms of the East, I honestly think they're getting it right. Whether there's um, the player and media vote swing towards Harden instead of Kyrie, um, it's really up to them. But either way, I think um, the Eastern Conference lineup looks fine. And I'm going to have to do the same for the Western Conference. I mean, I, I'm i okay with this. I'm just okay with this. I mean, if you have to go by voting, like I said, 100% fans. Steph Curry, number one um, in the West Guards quite comfortably. With his backcourt member is going to be Luka Doncic, which I'm completely fine with. And in the front court, LeBron James, Nikola Jokic, Kawhi Leonard. I, I'm okay with it. Like The fans are getting it right. I mean, we had before, um, what's his name? Zaza Pachulia almost making the All-Star game. I think coming fourth in that in the last year they had 100% fan voting. And I'm just glad that we've kind of gone past that. I think this is why, I mean, we still need the interaction with the voting and stuff. So I'm okay with the voting still there. Well, it's nice to know that you got the players and the 
media kind of to help balance it out so we won't have these like weird outliers and stuff like that. But in terms of the West, I'm completely fine with this. And the only thing maybe I could argue, I mean, again, in the Western spots, Damian Lillard, Luka Doncic, you could really flip-flop between them. Um, I would still kind of go Luka because of the all-around numbers, but Dame's team has the better record. But either way, I'm okay with this. LeBron, Jokic, Kawhi, not a problem. Um, Anthony Davis is still very popular. He's quite a way, for, um, even though he's number four, he's only 100K behind Kawhi. Like I said, Anthony Davis has kind of been a bit underwhelming this season, so I don't think he should be a starter. He'll be a, he'll be a bench guy, but that, that'll be fine for him. But yeah, I'm just okay with both these lineups. And um, even if, like, say, if I did like, the voting in today, I'd be okay with these Western starting lineups, So the Western and Eastern starting lineups. So I think the fans are getting it right. Um, obviously, there's going to have to joke players from here to there. Like I said, Alex Caruso down at the bottom there. Melo, who doesn't deserve to be an all-star, but he is um, highly popular in the NBA community. And people like Derrick Rose still getting shown love. But at the end of the day, those votes, votes don't matter. I mean, a lot of people I've seen were, com um, were complaining that Clay Thompson is still eighth in voting. I mean, it's just Clay Thompson. He's just a likable guy. But let's be honest, he wasn't going to get, even if the um, his vote was in the top two, he still wouldn't make it. Like, as long as we got the right guys in the all-star game, we're good. We're good. Like, whatever, people can vote who they want to and stuff like that. But as long as we get the right guys in there, I think there shouldn't be no problem. And right now, there's no problem with the voting at all. So, good job, NBA fans. Like, you know, we're, like we're actually getting this stuff right. Let's move on to this. Um, I got to talk about something that actually happened two seasons ago. If you all, if you guys remember Game 6 of the NBA Finals 2019... One, obviously, the Raptors won the championship. One of the greatest days as a Raptor, the greatest day as a Raptor fan is seeing our team hold the trophy up in the air, declaring ourselves as NBA champions. But there was another underlying storyline that um, was kind of sh um, pushed away until probably after the parade and stuff. And that was the Masai Ujiri case when he encountered the deputy chief in the arena. So let me paint you the scene. I, I have a feeling that many of you have already seen it. So, Masai Ujiri, obviously the Raptors won the NBA championship. He's trying to get on the court to help celebrate with his team, obviously. He's about to get on the court. You could see him in the video. If you haven't seen the video already, um, you could, it's very easy to find. He's, he's about to pull out his ID, but then he gets pushed by the security saying, Hey, who, who are you? Where are you going down to the court? He's like, wait, that's my team. <laughs> I, am the, I am the president of the Toronto Raptors. And then the... Um, and then the deputy sheriff just kept kind of like antagonizing him. He kept pushing him back, saying, go back to your seat, whatever, whatever. And there had to be people coming around to say that, look, this guy is the president of the Toronto Raptors. Like, what are you doing? Go ahead and go on the court. He's supposed to be talking, too. I mean, Kyle Lowry had to go over there and say, like, hey, 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 yo, Messiah, come over here. You just celebrate. Let's go. And it was just a really, really bad look. And the, and the thing is, it's like, um, he, like, the sheriff dropped the lawsuit on, on Masai after that. He claimed that he sustained significant injuries in, the, in his encounter to, with uh, Masai. And Masai tried to assault him. He tried to assault him when he had body cam footage. This is why body cam footage is so important. You could clearly see that Masai, not antagonizing at all, you could see him reach into a suit, try to grab out his ID, and then the, um, the security guard, I think, and then started antagonizing him. After all that, like, he was clearly in the wrong in that video. Like, like there's no way to, to go around it. And then he still, like, puts up this lawsuit. Obviously, Masai's trying to fight it. Um, and, you know, like, it's just... And, like, another, like, reasoning for, like, him, like, saying, like, why he tried to do this is that he was, like, he knew about the accidents that happened, like, those incidents where there were, like, a, a terrorist threat and, like, the Olympics and stuffing back in the day, like, come on, man, come on. Firstly, this is not just like obviously like you can't just um compare that to like a guy in a suit who is a recognizable figure for the Toronto Raptors to pass terrorist threats at the Olympics. That's just not the case, and I think like this guy, um, it, it, it's just stupid. <laughs> it's stupid. This whole situation was stupid, and obviously like I don't want to like take this back to politics, but. Look, like Masai Ujiri is a prominent black man in the NF in the NBA, obviously at a high management position. Um, he does a lot for the NBA in terms of the Giants of Africa program back in the day and stuff like that. 
And I think the deputy sheriff had a had a loss in like he lost his judgment. He did. And whether that had to do with race or not, we will never know. But that is it looks like a clear case of kind of like racial profiling. That's what it what it really was. And I mean Masai Ujiri obviously has shown that clip to the Raptors plenty of times. They've talked about this. And the Raptors like all shared their thoughts on it. So like I mean they know it's the case. Uh, Masai Ujiri has been trying to fight this court case for almost two years now. And this week, the case was finally dropped. It was finally dropped entirely. Like, there's no charges going on either way. And the thing is just kind of disappearing to the dust. Now, what I, like, I'm happy that like, Masai Ujiri didn't, like, like, he wasn't falsely convicted of anything. But at the same time, this guy, this is, like, this is something that needs to be just kind of looked at this type of situation and say, look, we need to train ourselves better as police. We need to look at this and like kind of like kind of reform how things are made because we cannot have these like lapse in judgment. You cannot have these like kind of assumptions that these these um, security guards are making. It's, it's just not fair. It's just not right. And honestly, it was a terrible look for the Warriors. I mean, there was two incidents during that final series. One was like one of the um, part owners of the um, of the Golden State Warriors pushed Kyle Lowry after he dove out of bounds. He pushed him, which he got suspended for I believe a year or two. And now this guy, I mean, he's I mean he's gonna get go out scotch free. And I just don't think it's right. I, I just don't think it's right. They they need to kind of reform just the whole way, um, like the police system is. And when people talk about you know defund the police. It doesn't mean getting rid of them. It isn't. It just reform the system um, and find ways to like kind of improve it by taking away some stuff, taking away some responsibility. Because at this point, it is being abused. It is. And this is not a good case. I'm just happy Messiah is getting off of it. He can go on and like not worry about this anymore. But man, that situation was ugly, man. That was ugly. One more thing to talk about before we head into the final segments of this show. We got to talk about Kevin Garnett because he, um, in a, I believe it was a, um, an interview with Dave, David Marchese of the New York Times, um, Kevin Garnett offered his thoughts on the current, um, NBA game. And it was a lot of good things to say, which I'm really happy about. So I'm going to read you the full quote. Defensive players have to take away angles, take angles away and stuff like that. But if you have any creativity and ambition, you could be a great offensive player in this league. The fadeaways, the one-legged runners, the one-legged ballot shots, that stuff that Dirk Nowitzki bought to our game, and now when I see the Joker play, it feels like he has taken the, that Dirkness and mixed it in with his own talent. And Steph Curry revolutionized things with being able to shoot it from distance with such consistency. Clay Thompson, Dean Willard, these guards are changing the game. And he goes on and ends like his statement saying, It's creative. It's competitive. It's saucy. You'll get dropped. A effing... <laughs> A mother effing will cross you over and break your ACL these days. And honestly, as like a, a younger NBA fan, obviously, I got, we've heard a lot of... If you're an NBA fan and you talk about this stuff with like older generations, whether it be your um, people within your family, and you hear like these old, these old guys, like these older players or retired players talk about it on TV, you hear a lot of negative stuff. And one way to put about it is like, you know, Charles Barkley likes to kind of um, put down the game a bit. We've heard Shaq on multiple occasions do the same thing. But for every few of those type of players, you'll get a Kevin Garnett. And the way that he talks about how this game has become more creative and more fun to watch is just music to my ears. And look, I mean, like, it's nice to see just someone of the past give praise to like how much the game has evolved. And not like the, the act like the old man who who tells those kids to stay off his lawn. Like the game is improving, and some people will be like, "Oh, the game was better back in my day," and all that. But when you get people, you know, kind of moving with the times, like just like saying, "Look, it has evolved so much, and look at where we are now. We have the most athletic players in the world. You've got, you know, these guys hitting like this is the most skilled the league has ever been." And seeing someone like KG kind of acknowledge that was nice. And he talked about like how um, like um, players back in the day like could not like work in today's game, but I think like 
I, and I kind of agree with that, obviously. I mean, the, the league is more skilled. Like, you cannot have players like um, Craig Eagle who can't dribble the ball as a as a two guard. You just can't at this point. I mean, but, like, it can go really either way. Like, obviously, the defensive intensity back in the day was a lot more, and I think that some players will not fare well in that scenario. But he's right. Some players from back then can't play today, and some players today can't play back then. That's just the way it is. And if one thing's for certain... The NBA is more skilled than ever, and what it looked, and this whole thing that at least Kevin Garnett is trying to like say as a whole is that the game is just in a good place right now. It's in a great place right now in terms of in in domestic ways, and the way that the, like we got many like many players from around the world coming to play our game, like we got like a, a huge boost in like, international players. Some of them are some of the best players in the league, a la um, Giannis Antetokounmpo, Nikola Jokic, and stuff like that. It's just getting more global, a lot better, more skilled. The NBA is in a great place right now, man, and it's only going to continue to grow. Thank you, Kevin Garnett, for actually giving this because for a lot of times this season, obviously the headlines were about all players kind of like, um, you know, bashing on today's generation and stuff like that. It's good to see that these like you see um, people like Kevin Garnett like praise it. And it was and honestly that just kind of made me happy. Before we end off, you have some other news and notes. Didn't talk about this during the Raptors segment, but the, the Tampa Bay Raptors will be staying in Tampa Bay for the remainder of this season, obviously due to um, border restrictions and stuff like that. And so the decision came yesterday that the Raptors are going to stay in Tampa Bay for the rest of the season. This was kind of expected. I mean, there have been um, chattings about maybe in March it could be fine enough for Raptors can go back to Toronto. I thought that was kind of a far possibility, and... This code shows that it was like that it, it's just not going to be possible. So for the rest of the season, we're going to be having the Tampa Bay Raptors. Hopefully, they come back next year. I want to go back to Jurassic Park. I want to go back to those Raptor games. But for this year, I don't mind. I'm still going to support the Toronto, the Tampa Bay Raptors, and all that. Hope they do well for the remainder of the season. Hope they are safe. Another point of news: Trey Young was fined twenty thousand dollars after profanity towards the officials at the end of the Dallas Mavericks game. Um, the play he was arguing about was um, he tried sending a screen, I believe, and really Cauley Stein kind of ran him over. He he kind of fell over, and he after the game he was just he was going off on the official. He looked so mad. He was yelling at the official and all that. And after the game, he was fined twenty k because of the profanity. I mean, if you guys watched the game, I I think I covered it in my daily recap yesterday. I thought it was a good no call. I mean, just because a seven footer is Going through a what to Trey Young's what six foot six one, like it's not a foul every time. He's at this point, he's just bigger than you, he's taller than you, he's stronger than you. Trey, that is not a foul at the end of the game. I could see it maybe happening what in like the second quarter with five minutes left, but at the end of the game, there's no way that's a foul. And I think that was a good no call, so good for the NBA for sticking up for that. And also, I didn't want to like talk about this again, I kind of went political on the whole. Um, Messiah's year situation, but the Dallas Mavericks will no longer be playing the national anthem pregame. Um, obviously, there there's some people who are like, eh, you know, the national anthem is part of this tradition and all that. And look, my situation on this, and this is the same for the Canadian national anthem. We don't need it every game. <laughs> That's the thing. I think it's fine to do it kind of on the bigger occasions. Maybe do it during the playoffs. Um, do it for like these like better like w- these like bigger events. But for every single game, we don't have to do it. We just don't have to do it. And obviously, with the whole like political tension in in the world right now, there could, it could cause division within a locker room for people kneeling, for people standing. And I think this is just a good way to um, kind of um, prevent the division happening. Um, like I said, maybe for the big games, probably better. But I just never really saw the point. Even here, like in Canada, um, the Toronto Raptors. Whenever I go to the Raptor game, there's always that national anthem. I love the guy singing it. I mean, he's one of my favorite guys in the organization. But at the end of the day, um, I just do not think it's necessary. I really do not think it's necessary. And people who are getting mad over this, like, come on. Like, it's it's not a big of a deal. And as long, I mean, the games are still being played on. Like, it doesn't really affect the game whatsoever. So, there's that. But yeah, those are the other news and notes. Let me know down below what you thought. If anything we talked about today, shoot me a DM, leave in the comment section below. That would be greatly appreciated. 
But before we head out, um, I obviously have to do my game of the weekend. My game of the weekend today, I have the Utah Jazz going up against the Milwaukee Bucks. And the Utah Jazz are two-point favorites. Both teams near the top um, elite teams in their conference in their own right. Utah being number one in the West. My, uh, Milwaukee being number two or number three. And this is going to be just a really, really good game. With Utah being minus two, minus two points, I will take the Jazz in this game. Just because they're one of the best three-point shooting teams in the league, I've talked about that on multiple occasions. I mean, I've, <laughs> I never thought I would be talking about the Jazz this much during the season, but we are, but they've been absolutely fantastic. And I just think that because the Milwaukee Bucks' um, way of you know, defending is, look, take the three. And I think <laughs> the Utah Jazz are going to be like, okay, we'll take it. And like I said in the past, you know, they got like three or four guys shooting over 40% from the field. I think that Rudy Gobert will help deter Giannis in the paint. I think it's going to be a good game, but I think the Utah Jazz will be able to pull it off and continue their hot streak. What's happy for me is that I am now 6-9, and nine, all right, <laughs> um, in, in, in um, the game of the week picks. I was happy that the, the Spurs beat the Warriors on that night. I mean, obviously, they got trashed by the Warriors the next night, but on the game I predicted, they beat the Warriors, so I got that point, so... Yeah, slowly but surely, I'm like the Toronto Raptors, slowly but surely, trying to get back to 500. And hopefully, this can continue with a Utah Jazz win. But yeah, I think this is where we're going to end today's episode. Thank you guys for watching or listening. Remember to show love on all the podcast channels. Like, share, and subscribe if you are on YouTube. And remember to follow at TV on Basketball on all social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, for just amazing NBA content. We are on the road to 1K followers on Instagram. We are so close. We are almost there. I believe we are 15 followers away um, at the time of recording. But yeah, um, um, just continue to show your support any way possible. I really appreciate all of you guys who are supporting the pod. I don't think I'm going to be doing the um, Wednesday YouTube videos for this foreseeable future just because I am in school and I'm trying to kind of balance things out for a bit. So I might not be doing those Wednesday YouTube videos. Hopefully, they'll come back maybe in a couple weeks, maybe a month or two. But right now, I'm just going to be sticking to the two podcasts a week. But yeah, I'm going to be keep doing that. I have some guests lined up down the line, so hope you guys are um, ready for that. And again, just continue to support your any way possible. And yeah, thank you guys for all the support, like I said. And hope you all have a fantastic day. Hope you guys enjoy the rest of this NBA season. Hope you enjoy your weekend. And yeah, just... I just can't wait to talk more basketball in the future. So take it easy, guys. TV signing out. Peace.